are creatures of habit, are we not? Yes. And when I get here on a Sunday and we have a guest speaker, I never know what I'm supposed to do. You know, it's like this is there's just something not right. But uh, so they stuck me on the Lord's Supper table this morning and then didn't tell me until we were back there that I had the prayer for the communion. And it's like, man, you guys, I love you very much. <laughs> Friends like that. So, hey, this morning in our class, uh, we're studying Ecclesiastes in our Sunday morning Bible class, and we were talking this morning about how we have to come to terms with the fact that sometimes we don't know exactly where God is directing us. And, uh, the, the, you know, man plans his ways, but it's God that is in control of everything. And I, I told you last week that Leroy was going to be here speaking to us today. Uh, Leroy shared with me this morning, I hope you don't mind me sharing a little bit of what we talked about this morning. Uh, Leroy has been, he's been working at the uh, rescue mission in Galesburg for a while, uh, about 13 years now. And he said he feels like it's time for him to be doing something different, that the Lord is calling him someplace else. And so he's been looking for other opportunities and he said there weren't any doors opening. And then they finally got a call from a, a children's home out in Ohio, and they thought this must be where God wants us to go, but there were some steps that had to be taken there. And during that process, we contacted him. And he's like, wow, this must be where I'm supposed to go. Uh, but now he's kind of at this point where it's like, you know, he wants to go where God wants him to be. And that's the kind of people we all need to be. Amen? We put this process in God's hands when we started looking for a, a community outreach evangelist. And so we're wanting God to bring the person here that he needs to serve. Leroy wants to go where God wants him to serve. And so we're going to be putting all of this in God's hands. Just kind of wanted to let you know what the process is and where we are with all of that right now. But we did ask Leroy to come up and speak to us this morning. I was going to read through Leroy's resume that he sent to us. I'm not going to read through all of that other than to tell you he began training for ministry back in 1987. Uh, I believe it was. He entered the, the Sunset School of Preaching in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, there are, uh, are a list of churches where Leroy has served as the uh, pulpit minister, as the education minister, as the benevolence outreach minister and, and just different th functions that he served. He's taught teen classes, he's been in charge of education, many places where he's been. But on every resume, one of the things that he puts on there is evangelist. And if you read through, as I shared with you last week, every place he's gone, Leroy and his wife Carolina have worked to take whatever benevolence work the church was doing and turn that into an evangelistic outreach. That's one of the reasons we're looking at for Leroy to come here and work with us. He has that talent. He has that wisdom and that experience. But I'm going to let Leroy share some with you this morning. Did everyone get one of these envelopes? He asked us to make sure every household had an envelope, and Leroy is going to be uh, talking about those this morning. But I'm going to have Leroy come up here. We're going to have a prayer before he gets started. If you want to come on up. Uh, I've known Leroy for almost as long as I've been here. It's been about 19 years, I think, since I first met Leroy. I've always just thought the world of him. He is a very wise, calm man. And I'm going to let him tell you his full name because I cannot pronounce it all. Uh, I'll let him do that for you. But I want to have a prayer with Leroy before we get started. Our Father, I thank you so much for bringing my brother here to speak to us today. Father, I pray that you bless what he has to say, that our hearts will hear it, that it will be a message that comes from you. I pray, Father, that you'll be with Leroy and Carolina as they're seeking to serve in the place that you have called them to serve. I pray, Father, that you make it abundantly clear to them where they serve, but even if you don't make it abundantly clear, I pray that he will serve you faithfully. And I pray, Father, that you'll always direct him where he needs to be. So bless him this morning. Bless us all, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for having me here. I uh, want to begin with turning the power on.
Uh, hold it. There is a passage of scripture that, there you go. Now, this is a passage of scripture that all of you should be very familiar with. Am I correct? Obviously, I didn't realize that until I looked up here and I told Carolina, look at the banner. They're cheating already. They're cheating. But that's a passage of scripture that uh, I, was, I, I want to speak uh, with you or to you about. It's one that we are very familiar with, and we should be very familiar with. Uh, and, you know, so you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and, and then teaching them to obey, or some versions have to observe everything I have commanded you, and I am with you to the end of the age. That's where I'm going to end. I just wanted you to know that that's the whole point of everything that I'm going to be saying and sharing with you this morning is I'm heading towards that. But that's not where I want to begin. Where I want to begin is talking to you about a time uh, that existed on this planet in a particular place where during the day uh, there would be light blue skies from one horizon to the other in every direction that you would look. It would be a beautiful, cloudless sky, a light blue. The breeze would be blowing gently. There were no winters. <laughs> no winters in this place. And no summers. It was like a constant temperature, and it was a lovely and beautiful place to be. And it existed here on this planet. At night, you can hear the sounds of animals. Uh, you can look up in the sky and there would be millions and billions of stars. And, and there were no obstacles, there was no light pollution. And it, it felt like as if they would be so close. And you were so close to them. Things were quiet. Uh, there was animals of every kind. There was no fear of, of them and us. And there was no fear of us in them. It was a beautiful place. And it existed here on this planet. There were trees of every color and of every size. There were plants that would give off aromas that would just calm your soul. Ease your spirit. There were animals of every size and shape and things that crept along the ground. And it was beautiful. It must have been beautiful because it sounds beautiful. But that was a place that did exist here on this planet and it was, it was very real. In this place there was, there was peace. There was no war. Uh, there was unity. Everything and everybody was doing what they were created to be and to do. Uh, there was oneness. Oneness of heart, oneness of mind, <coughs> oneness of purpose, oneness of love and life. There was oneness. There was perfect unity. In the midst of all this, there was one man, and there was one woman. His name was Adam, and her name was Eve. And they loved each other. And they loved everything that surrounded them. And they loved the one who made it all, God. They knew him intimately. They shared their times together. And it was, it was beautiful. 
until one day it wasn't. Everything changed. For the very first time, a thought entered their mind. A thought that they had never even considered or imagined. A thought of death. And everything associated with that. Loneliness. Isolation. Fear. Mortality, vulnerability, those are things that had never entered their mind. They had never experienced the feelings, the fears of what the thought of death brought into their life. Never imagine that. Just imagine what we would be like if death didn't exist in our, in our minds. Or if death was not a way of life for us. Well, that's the way it was for them. Until that thought, until that deed that brought that thought into their minds existed. Now there is separation. The unity, the peace, and the oneness that existed now feels different. It feels distant. It feels very scary. They know that things can never go back to, way, to the way they once were. And God knows that they cannot stay the way they are now. There is mortality. So, here's one thing. So what, uh, this is a, a passage of scripture there that there is a series of events that transpire and God calls a man and woman to account uh, and he tells them uh, that uh, there's going to, it's, what you did not only affects the relationship between each, both of you and, and, and God himself, but it has a negative impact on the created order. On creation, on all creation, it has a negative impact. And so he says this, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. And I just want to uh, highlight this passage of scripture because there's going to be another reference to it later on. It's going to tie all of this together to where I want to end up, which is in Matthew chapter 28. We're, remember, heading towards this passage of scripture. Matthew chapter 28. We find that uh, in Genesis chapter 3 verse 23, the Lord banished man from the garden, and he drove the man out. So, see, in Matthew chapter 28, see, God's saying, go. That's not the first go. This is the first go. The Lord banished the man from the garden. The Lord drove him out. In other words, what he's saying is, you got to go. You can't stay here. I'm not going to reward you with something good for you having done something bad. You must go. So now, if they were smart, if they were really smart, if Adam and Eve were smart and they would have wanted to remain the heroes, what they would have done is never talk about what happened in the garden. They would have never talked about the mistake that they made and how they ruined it all and how it was perfect in the place where they were living. But no, because of one choice, one decision, it was never going to be the same. If they were smart, like me, I would never have talked about the mistakes that I had made. Because you know what? Life would have gone on. We're out of the garden. We're out of that perfect place. And from here on now, people are going to know that, you know, all of those generations and they're all the good that's going to happen in the lives of those people that we propagate, it all started with me. You know? It started with Adam and Eve. Where are they going to be the heroes of the story? And the only way we can be the heroes of the story is not to share with anyone what we did or what happened in the garden. If they were smart, that's what they would have done, right? They would have just started about the, you know, how, how life was from the first day out of the garden. Remember, the command already was go. Leave the garden. You have to go. So I ask myself, and we have to ask ourselves, well, did they talk about it? Did they begin to teach? 
Well, I asked myself, okay, did they do that? Well, uh, my wife, uh, we, we study together all the time, and she bounces ideas off me and I off her. Uh, some of mine stick, but most of the time, <laughs> she's got the better idea. She said, well, how did Cain and Abel know how to bring offerings to God? I mean, they, they, you know, it's not something that God... We don't have in Scripture, it's something that God revealed to them. So Adam and Eve must have told them, this is what will please God, if you do this. So they chose not to keep the garden experiences to themselves. They evangelized, they gospelized, they talked about their experiences and encounters with God with their children. So I thought, okay, well, maybe if I was if they were really smart, they would just talk about the good things, not the bad things. <clears throat> this is what, this is, so anyway, we know that there's something bad that happens between the two brothers, Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain kills uh, his brother. But they did have that, that had knowledge of how to bring, or that they should bring offerings to God. So Adam and Eve must have talked to them about their encounters and experiences with God. Here's something else, too. In Genesis chapter 4, when Seth is born, this is what Eve says. With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. In other words, what she's saying is God is still good to us. You, and even after everything that we did in the garden, having been banished and drawn out or driven out, God is still good to us. He's causing them to, or allowing them to have, uh, bring forth life. So in Genesis chapter 5, I asked myself, okay, well, okay, so it's only the good things that they're doing or repeating about the experiences in the garden. Uh, but we find here in Lamech's case, Lamech is the tenth, uh, the ninth generation from Adam. Uh, the ninth person or the ninth generation from Adam, and Lamech is the father of Noah. And the name Noah means rest. And so Lamech says, I'm going to name you rest because maybe through you, God will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. Now what is significant of this is that Lamech is quoting something that only Adam and Eve and God and Satan knew about. This is what God said to Adam and Eve while they were still in the garden before he drove them out. And so yes, you see, Adam and Eve, they talked about their faith. They not only, they, they talked about their experiences and their encounters with God while they were in the garden, but not just the good stuff, they talked about all of it. Because all of it is good. Even this part. So Lamech is, is, is naming his son Noah because this is, he's saying, this, this may bring relief to what our parents did in the garden. So they gospel eyes. They talk about God. They, Adam and Eve, talked about their experiences with God. Next. Abraham. Uh, we come to Abraham, another a great figure in the Old Testament, in, in our history, in our genealogy. Uh, we come to Abraham. We know that Abraham was a man who... Uh, uh, scripture tells us that he was a man who grew up in a house uh, full of idol worshippers. That his father uh, was an idol worshipper. That he served other gods. Uh, and then uh, we know that God calls him from the land of Ur, or from the land of the Chaldeans. And what does he say? It's that word go again, right? Or in Abraham's case, Abraham's case, it's leave. Uh, leave uh, your country and your people and go to a place that I will show you. Uh, again, it's, it's go. 
Leave where you're at and, and, and go to a place where I will show you. And along the way, you, you're going to be able to experience me in your daily life. You're going to be able to experience highs and lows and, and successes and failures. Uh, I'm going to put, you're going to be able to, dis, you're going to discover that the relationship that you have with me is going to be able to sustain you during difficult times. And when we read about the life of Abraham, we know that that is true. But the reason why God chose him among all the people, he tells us in Genesis 18, 19. I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. So what is that saying? It's saying that I have chosen him because I know that he will talk about me. He will talk about me. Uh, just like Adam and Eve chose to talk about their experiences with God uh, to the next generations. God chose Abram because he says, I know that he will talk about me. He'll talk about me uh, with his kids. He'll talk about me with uh, the people that he has the greatest influence in, or with, with those in his household. He will talk about me. That's why, that's the one thing I know about him. That's why I have chosen him. And because he did, we have the historical document written telling us about his encounters and the experiences that he had with God. So, again, he's go, because I know who talks. He gospelizes. Moses. Moses is another character in the Old Testament. Uh, God, we know that he had uh, all kinds of experiences and encounters with God. So here's another one that is sent or told to go. Uh, and Moses in Exodus 3.10, right? Go. There it is again. Go. And where we're heading to is this one in Matthew 28, where Jesus says, go. And make disciples. I'm sending you to Pharaoh, that you may bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And in that experience uh, of, of doing what God told him to do, not everybody's going to listen to him. His own people are going to ignore him. Some will reject him. They're going to give him a hard time. Yeah, and uh, think about the 40 years of uh, wandering in the wilderness. All of those experiences with God. He talked about those with those people that God sent him to liberate and to bring out of slavery. So there's a lot of going. When Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, it's not the first time. It has always been going. Always. To people who are willing to talk about their experiences with God with others. It's that simple. The 72. Now we jump to the New Testament. There's a whole bunch of people that God has always been sending to go. Luke uh, 10, 17, 72, return with joy, saying, even the demons submit to us in your name. And I allude to this, I mean, there's a lot of verses in the New Testament that we can go to that are associated with the idea of going or being sent by God. But I picked this one because this is, this is the key to understanding what the battle is. The whole reason why Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, the whole reason why they... They were banished and driven out by the Lord. They had to go. It was because of this guy. Because of Satan. And his evil forces. And so God, in simply sending people out to go and to share with others their experiences about the encounters that they have with God, it's more than just, you know, bringing people in the church on Sundays and more members. It is a truly a victory of spiritual proportions. It is a spiritual battle that we are engaged in. 
And that's why Scripture t tells us in, in some places that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. And where Christ is seated is far above, far above all powers and principalities and authorities and spiritual forces, dark spiritual forces. That is where Christ is seated and that is where we also uh, reign from. Or that's where our authority comes from. It is always the battle to undo, undo what Satan did in the garden that got Adam and Eve kicked out. Who started this whole thing. So the 72. And then Jesus says, yes, see, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. This is the response from them being sent and talking, sending out by Jesus and just talking about their experiences with God. It's a spiritual battle. It's, it's more going on than just uh, numbers and making friends and, and having this feeling of success by the physical appearance of things. It's a spiritual victory. When you talk about your encounters or your experiences with God, all of heaven is listening. All of heaven is listening. And all of heaven is on your side. And in heaven, the victory has already been won. We're just living that victory out here. And, and here where the battle is taking place is sometimes we're going to encounter defeats, just like Abram. Remember how many times he failed? He, in Genesis chapter 12, he receives a promise of God saying, I will make you into a great nation. I will make your name great. And then he runs out a little bit of food. It doesn't say that he's starving. I mean, he had enough food to make it to Egypt. But he runs out a little low on food. And what does he do? He begins to depend on his own resources again. Failure. We all fail. We all fall short. But the battle rages on. So we stand up, we dust ourselves off, and we go at it again. And what are we doing? All we're doing is telling others about our experiences with God. How good He is. And that's what Eve said in the beginning, you know, after, after being kicked out and driven from the garden. The first thing that she said when it came to producing life again was, God is still good to us. With the Lord's help, He has enabled me to bring forth a man. God is still good to us. That's always been our hope. It's a spiritual battle. Here, Jesus sends out the twelve. I want you to just take this uh, in, in Matthew chapter 10. Is this passage of scripture familiar to anybody? Listen, I, I need to tell you something. <clears throat> We often take this out of context. We often take this, this passage of scripture to apply to someone that we are sharing the gospel with or just talking about our experiences with God. That's what I mean when it's sharing the gospel, okay? How we have spent time reading the word, praying with God, associating and being together with other Christians, having our faith built up, and then talking about those experiences with people who don't have those experiences in the world. That's evangelism. Okay? That's evangelism. Taking my experiences and that, uh, that I've had with God through the years and, and sharing them with you. And they help. That's all it is. Nothing to be afraid of. But here's a passage of scripture that we often apply this way. We say, we're going to go out and we're going to evangelize, you know, and we're going to try to get people to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We're going to try to get them to somehow confess publicly to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, or that they claim Him as a Savior, that He is King of kings and Lord of lords. We apply it to the person that we are evangelizing or sharing our experiences with. But in this context, in Matthew chapter 10, this is applied to the people who are sent to talk to others about their experiences with God. 
before this, Jesus says, hey, listen, I'm going to send you out like sheep, like, 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 wool, like sheep among wolves. Uh, people are going to kick you out of the synagogue. Some of you are going to be thrown in jail. You're going to have a hard time. Not everyone is going to accept you. Not everyone is going to believe you. Lots of people are going to reject you. I'm sending you out. And keep this in mind. If you let that stop you, whoever, not the whoever out there, but the whoever of you 12, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Just remember this, that as you're going out and talking and sharing your experience with other people, I am talking about, I am talking uh, to God about you, what you're doing. I'm acknowledging you, that you are fulfilling the purpose that I'm telling you to go out and do. But if you let that hold you back, the hard times, the difficulties, and you stop talking about me, about your experiences with me, I'm going to stop talking to my father about you. That's where it applies. So, here we go. I'm making my way to this goat right here. Okay? You know that on this Resurrection Sunday, uh, there is a big earthquake. And uh, the women were on the way to the tomb. Soldiers were already there. They were supposed to guard the tomb. Uh, there is a big earthquake. And, and then the soldiers, they see suddenly an angel, that the stone had been rolled away, and there is an angel there. And the scripture says that his countenance, or that his uh, face was like uh, lightning, and that his remnant was white as snow. So something brilliant is just shown up. And the stone is rolled away. In the Bible, I like the way uh, the Bible describes it. They became like dead men. You know what that looks like? Like this. Right? I mean, they became like dead men. I mean, this thing just freaked them out. They did not know what to do. So they take off. They take off. Some go this way, some go that way. They scatter to the wind. Some of them went to the priests and elders of the people. And the elders of the people and the priests came up with a plan. The plan was, you know what? When people ask you what happened, this is, we got to get our story straight as to what really took place. So what you could tell them, the elders told them, is his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. You've heard that, right? Yeah, because because uh, it says, right? And the soldiers took the money, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Of course, see, you've heard the proof that Scripture is inspired, because you've heard this story. So this is what they began to say. That was the story. I always ask myself, how did they know it was their disciples who took the body? They were asleep. <laughs> so, so uh, this is the story. And it's interesting who is that scripture points out that it was circulated among the Jews. Okay? It wasn't just the Jews who knew what was taking place, you know, when Christ was crucified. It was big, lots of people there. This is a story that was circulated among the Jews. All the apostles were Jews. Jesus was Jewish. This is a story, okay, that was circulated among them. Let's see where we go here now. So, here it is. There, you have to understand that there is a lapse of time in Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. There is a, a lapse of time, at least 40 days, between verse 16 and 17, where it says that this is the story that was circulated among the Jews, that the disciples, his disciples came during the night and stole his body away while we were asleep. 
and then immediately after that, in verse 18, it begins, therefore go. This one. But right here, okay? This is, there is, there's about 40 days that take place. Because Jesus Christ didn't give the commission on Resurrection Sunday. He didn't give them the commission on Resurrection Sunday. There are things that happen. You know, like the fish that were caught by the sea, uh, eight days later after Resurrection Sunday, there's, there's Thomas. There's about eight appearances, eight events where Jesus showed up. Luke tells us in Acts chapter 1 that for a period of 40 days, he met with them off and on, talking about the kingdom of God. So there is at least a period of 40 days that transpire that this story, what story? That this story has been circulated. Where? Among the Jews. 40 days that this story has been circulated. And so, when the eleven saw him, this is like 40 days later, because they're on the Mount of Galilee and he's about to ascend. 40 days later, when the eleven saw him, Judas is not there, they worshipped him. Well, what happens? <clears throat> some doubt. It. But some doubt. It. It's not a whole big group of disciples there, it's the eleven. Why did they doubt? Well, there's a story that's been circulated among the Jews for about 40 days now. Maybe they doubted that, you know, they were complete failures. Maybe they doubted, you know, I mean, they all abandoned him. They all left him in the garden. Nobody, not one of them stood up and said, wait a minute, you guys got it all wrong. He's an innocent man. Nobody was willing to lay down their lives for him, really, to defend him. They failed. And maybe they doubted because they thought, well, maybe I don't know enough. Maybe they, they thought that, you know, I don't know if these experiences have been, if I begin to share them, if anybody would believe. They doubted. Isn't that the very same thing that Eve, Adam and Eve did? They doubted the Word. They doubted their experience with the living Word. Isn't that the same problem that Moses had, that Abram had? They doubted. Because they took their eyes and they focused off the living Word and they began to put it on themselves. They, think about, they began to think too much about themselves. Maybe I don't know enough. What if they ask me the wrong question? Look at my life. I know who I am. Maybe other people in church don't know who I am, but I know who I am. I'm not worthy. I'm a failure. I don't know the words. Some doubt of their experiences. But still, in spite of that, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth, everything. Listen, I know it all. I know about your past, I know about your present, and I even know about your future. But go. Just go. Because in going, you're going to experience me in a whole new way. You're going to experience some things, you're going to come to know some things about me, about God, and about you and us together, that you're going to be able to overcome those fears. You're going to be able to overcome those doubts. You're going to finally get over yourself and begin to think and think more about me than about you. Because the story that you're sharing with others is not about you. It's about me and you. So he says, go. Just go. Because it's always been going. And as we do, we get over ourselves as we do that. One of the things that we're going to realize it's the very same thing that he realized in the beginning. God is still good to us. He has not given up. He still wants me to talk to somebody about him. God is still good to us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your love for each of us is endless. 
Uh, you have allowed us to experience so many things in this life with you so that you, we would know that you have never left us and that your promise is true that you would never abandon us. And so thank you for those experiences. We know that we don't have to uh, quote scripture, book, chapter, and verse in order to convert people or bring them or share with them a saving knowledge of who you are. Because your word is living in us. And it will live through us. But we do need to read it in order for it to do that. So thank you. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for commissioning us. Thank you for sending us. Thank you for reminding us that you are still good. And thank you for the reminder, Father, through your word. Help it encourage us so that we may continue to go and make disciples of all nations. For Jesus' honor and for his glory, we give you thanks. Amen. Okay, let me see real quick. One thing. Uh, Inside of your envelope, you don't have to open it right now. Uh, if you do, you might lose a couple of items, okay? But I want you to take it with you. Inside your envelope, you're going to find a little a card, okay? On the front of the card is this. This is your personal invitation to join us, right? And ask for, that's where you would sign your name. Please be mindful of the fact, no, no personal information. You don't want you sharing any personal information. No last names. No last names. Ask for Leroy, okay, or uh, or Danny, or Juan, or Pedro, or Jose, okay. <laughs> so that's where you would put your name, but no last name, just first name. And you'll see that there is the name of the church, the address, the telephone number, and free Bible study by mail or online. Call or go to MolineChurchChrist.org, and they will find that information there, okay. On the back of that card, on the back of that card is the times of worship on Sunday morning and Wednesday evening, and then the activities that uh, you guys share in, okay? So that would be, that's a little piece of card in there. That's the thing that you would leave in the envelope. There's another thing that you don't want to leave in the envelope. And this is just a slip of paper that's going to remind you of what I'm going to share with you now, okay? There is a stationery, one sheet, stationery in the envelope. I want you to write a handwritten personal letter. Sharing it with people, with someone, sharing with someone, the someone that you're going to pick, okay? Sharing with someone this information. Now this is just a guideline so that when you go home and you're sitting at the coffee table and you pull this little slip out of this envelope and you're going to use this stationery or your own favorite stationery. This one, I like this one, it has little angels. Uh, uh, you can you can allude to this slip of paper as a reminder of like of what uh, you can include in your letter. Uh, that way, I, because I don't want you to go home and say, "Now, what did he say? What did he say? I'm supposed to put in there? handwritten letters are so meaningful. Uh, when you receive a handwritten letter, which is very rare today, everyone gets text. You know, but your text in the beginning of the morning is going to be like text number 101 by the end of the day. And it's going to be forgotten. But handwritten letters are meaningful. It uh, signifies that uh, it's caring and it's taking time. So in the letter, you can talk about just first names only. Okay? First names only. If it's uh, more than one in your household, then it's dad and family. Okay? Dad and family. No last name. This first name is only. Uh, no sender's address on the envelope. So on the envelope, don't put your address on the sender side of it. Don't put your address because they have the information already on the car if they want to communicate. They have the church information. They have the church telephone number. They have the church address. And they have the uh, web page address as well. So don't put your sender's address on the envelope. The way you're going to know how to or who to send it to is just pick up the telephone book. Uh, prayer is the most important thing. Open the telephone book to the Moline City telephone book and pray and just point and 
That's the name and that's the address. Okay? Don't worry if more than one of you picks the same person. Great. How wonderful it would be to receive two letters. Okay? Two letters from two different individuals talking about their life's experiences with this church. Okay, so first names only, no personal information. Don't have them call your house. They have the church number on the card. Okay, do not put your information on the outside of the envelope for return address. Because they have the church address inside the card. Just put their name. You can use the whole front of the label for that or the envelope. Okay, what do you like about this church? It's just a guy to get you started writing. What do you like about this church? Well, should I dare I, dare I, dare I ask? I like the singing. You know, and then share a little bit of the why. You know, uh, uh, length of time you've attended. And you don't have to put it in this order. This is just a guy. How long have you been here? I've been here for 10 years and would, I, I really enjoy blah, blah, blah. Don't put blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, what do you enjoy about this church? Uh, in the beginning, what drew you to this church? And how has this church helped you spiritually? Remember, this is going to be to a person that you want to, to uh, make them feel welcome through this letter, that it's safe and it's okay for them to come to church because here's...